five, five, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one. You know, we have an amazing team of leaders here, our teaching team, Angela, Cece, uh, Daniel. Um, they do an outstanding job speaking into this church, and I just want to say that's awesome. And, and give them a round of applause, can you? So you got, before you leave service today, you've got to go back to the coffee area. Ross Peters, Ross and Brittany, who are members of our church here, Ross, it's, he built from rescued wood, distressed wood, wood that belonged to something else, and he made an amazing coffee area that's on wheels. It is so awesome. His mom, Jackie, who's here, is so proud. She goes, do you like what Ross built? I said, no. <laughs> I love what Ross built. For, and it just, you know, it embodies Gracetown. We take the imperfect, we take the used up, maybe st stuff that people threw away. We've got people in here that life threw you away. Other people said, you, you won't mount to nothing. And we say, Gracetown, oh, come to us. Come on, we'll inspire you. We'll strengthen you. We'll help you. We'll lead you to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And you know what? God uses junk wood. He uses messed up, distressed, because of worn out wood. And that's what, that embodies the vision of Gracetown. And so Ross, Brittany, thank you so much for doing that and building that. that I'll, I'm forever grateful. Let's give them a big round of applause too, can we? All right, I'm, I'm going to talk to you today, finding a way to win. You know, last week we talked on the F word, you did what? Yeah, we talked about failure. And, uh, but today, I'm going to talk to you about finding a way to win. Now, here's what we're going to understand. You know, we've been on this Olympic thing and sports theme. And just because if you read the epistles, Paul likens life to sports. He really does. And sports is so preeminent in our society today. It's so preeminent, it's ridiculous. It really is. The money, the, it's just crazy and it's almost wrong, okay? We, we actually magnify it, but sports has been around since the days uh, of Jesus and prior to Jesus. You know, and Paul actually talked about the Olympics and the Corinthian games. He talks about winning in life and winning in life is never a matter of chance. It's always a result of tirelessly and creatively looking for a way to find solutions to problems or to just win. Our text is found in Proverbs 25, verse 2 in the Living Bible. And it says this, it is God's privilege to conceal things and the king's privilege to discover and in invent. In other words, God has given us, you and I, the power and the responsibility of searching for solutions to problems, for finding a way to win. There's always going to be solutions to challenges. Never ever settle for where you are. 
Don't live your life and go, well, this is it. This must be it. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy when people around me say something can't be done. What? You just cussed. You just denied Christ three times. You can't say something can't be, that can't happen, that won't work. No, we are humans. We have a treasure, Paul said, in earthen vessels. This, the, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. So the creator of the world, of heavens and earth, resides on the inside of you. So there is no impossibility to things. There's always a way. There's always a solution. There's always a way to win. So my point, first point, number one, there is always a way to win with God. Isn't that deep? There's always, when it comes with God, Always a way to win. Psalms 107, 4 through 7 says, Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. They couldn't find a place to settle. They couldn't find a way to do anything, and God led them. There's always a way to win with God. God does not want you and I to live a defeated life, but he does want us to be solution-oriented, to find a way to win in this life. And he gives us these ways. He really does. We have just, ha we just got to open up our eyes and look for it. Open up our ears and hear. It's amazing that many times we've throughout the New Testament, he, it says this, he that hath an ear. Anybody have ears? He said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. It's not that God's not talking. It's that we're not listening. There is a way to win in life. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is for those of us who feel like there's no way of escape. There's no way out. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide, look at that, he'll provide. Now, this is talking about temptation, but it's also likened to other things. He will also provide a way out a way out so that you can endure it. Many times, folks, we tend to become blind to solutions when we are under pressure. Usually when we're under pressure and we're under stress, it's hard to hear Rob say, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. God's going to make a way when there seems to be no way. And he's going, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Oh, I got a feel. And you know, we're singing it, and we're saying it, and, he's, and I'm preaching it, and we're all, we're all going. <laughs> I don't, no, I am too overwhelmed with stress. I got too much pressure. And when you're under pressure, you become blind. You become deaf. You, can't, you cannot some way see the way out. But we should never accept the fact that we are hemmed in and that there's no way out. Never, never feel like you are hemmed in like that. God is not a God who hems us in. God is not a God. He's a God who makes a way into wide open spaces. I remember hearing a preacher back in the day, oh, God gonna make a way when there seems to be no way. Can I get a witness? Anybody here? Okay, you know, that's a little old school. And I can do that too, just so you know. Moses, children of Israel, three to four million of them escaped Egypt. They're on their way out of Egypt and they get to the Red Sea. Some scientists are so ignorant. That didn't happen. What? Yeah, and Moses is like, what are we going to do? The people of Israel are going, what are we going to do, Moses? We're going to drown. And Moses is like, no, we serve a God who doesn't hem us in. We serve a God that makes a way when there seems to be no way. When you feel like you're hopeless, when you don't know what to do and everything's up against you, 
God said to Moses, lift up your rod. You know, it's a, it's a type of worship. Lift up God and watch him do something. God responds to people's worship. He doesn't respond to us standing like a stick. He responds to our heart, our movement, our words, our expressions. He responds to praise. He, and he'll, he'll make, listen, here's what he did. This actually happened. It's Bible. It's true. He parted the Red Sea. And the Bible says they walked on dry ground. And when they got to the other side, he caved in that, that sea that was a big barrier, a wall holding up. And when a Pharaoh and his army went there to chase him, drowned him. I know, I've seen the movie. But listen, the new movie, get the, uh, Pharaoh got out. I'm like, what? Bible didn't let Pharaoh out. He was gone. You know what I mean? History. You know, but that's the way God makes a way when there seems to be no way. Isaiah 43, 16, thus saith the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. Life overwhelm you, come like a river, you slip like I did, nearly beat the tar out of your, lock the breath out of you, bruise your ribs, fall in the water. Thank God somebody made a way and phew, snatches us up, right? Folks, every great feat and every engineering in this world accomplishment took place. Here's why. Because men and women who decided to not give up, use their wisdom, use their intelligence, and said, we're not going to give up until we find a way. For example... The French tried for 19 years to build what we call now the Panama Canal. Some of you have been down there before. Pretty amazing thing. They concluded, listen, after losing millions of dollars and some 22,000 lives in the process, it couldn't be done. They actually said, this is not God's will. And the French said, we're done. We're not touching it. We're pulling our companies out. We're pulling our money out. We're pulling our men out. Because the reason why they said it couldn't be done was because the two seas were linked by a canal laid on different levels. So the two seas were on different levels. So they felt like their task was impossible. Then all of a sudden, there came along these people called the Americans. Come on, somebody who have tenacity and strength and a, a heart and a desire that we don't know what it's like to give up. Kick us when we're down. Yes, we face defeat at times, and yes, we lose the battle, but we're gonna find every way we can to win the war. We succeeded as Americans, listen to me, in what is now considered, ready? A miracle of engineering. They call it a miracle of engineering because what happened was some of the guys from America invented locks that filled with water to allow the ships to travel up to the next level. Therefore, we have the Pan Panama Canal and things are going through back and forth on a daily basis, millions and millions and millions of dollars, everything because of that. You know what happened? The Americans found a way to win, found a solution to the problem. Uh, Lord Kelvin said it like this, when you are face to face with difficulty, you are actually up against a discovery. Something that you find difficulty in your life and you find troublesome and it's a problem is, uh, 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 I remember Oral Roberts saying, is something you are meant to solve. You're meant to solve it because it's up against you. How are we gonna do that? How do we have, how do we have the tenacity to do that? Number one, you, gotta have a, you have to have an attitude of action. Now, I'm gonna say some things over the next few minutes. I don't wanna offend you, but just hear me out. Proverbs 23, seven, as a man thinketh in his heart, right? So is he. We've talked about that numerous times before. Men are never moved by things, but by the views that we actually take of them. 
Folks, we are not supposed to adopt a fearful, fatalistic attitude about struggles, about disappointments, about defeats, about difficulties. We are to have an attitude of action that we're going to find a way to win. That's, you got to action. How many of you have ever had an idea come to you? And you never moved on it, but you thought about it and say, oh man, that would be a great idea. Only to find out six months to a year later, you see it in the stores. Has that ever happened to anybody? And then you're going, my, what? I thought about that. You know, we have some 67,000 thoughts a day and ideas is what they say. The problem is not because you didn't have the thought, Somebody else had the same thought. The difference is they just didn't think about it. They thought about it, then they took action. Christians, I believe, struggle with the actions. I don't know if we struggle with faith. I'm not sure we struggle with belief all the time. I believe we struggle with the works part of it. Listen, Ephesians 3.20, this is what it says about God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power. Whose power? God's power that works in us. God's power is not working outside of you. God's power is actually working inside of you. Once you think of possibilities and you can see things break through in your life and around your life, you can never go back to the small confines of a mediocre, limited, average life. Remember Leonardo da Vinci once said, iron rust from disuse. Stagnant water loses its purity. Cold weather becomes frozen. And so does inaction sap the vigors of the mind. That's why Paul tells us numerous times and time again, even in Romans and Ephesians and Colossians, he tells us be renewed in your mind, renew your mind, change your thinking, think differently, think on a different level. He's constantly, listen, if we settle and we accept whatever comes along our way without even trying to win over these negative circumstances. There's always going to be negative circumstances. You got that right? There's always going to be somebody in your life that says that's dumb, that can't be done. What are you thinking? Come on. But we will not, I don't want to shrivel up and become stagnant and stale. So I want to have an attitude of action, which brings me to this point. There's a time to pray, and then there's a time to play. Turn to your neighbor and say, is there a time to pray? And there's a time to play. For example, in the book by Stephen Pyle called The Book of Heroic Failures, I was reading through while I was, you know, putting together some thoughts for last week. He said the story, this is a story, true story of a soccer match between the Brazilian teams, um, Rio Prado and the Corinthians. And it highlights the need, you ready? to be practical. While the Brazilian goalkeeper, Isidore um, Irander, was still kneeling with his eyes shut and praying for his pre-match prayers, like a lot of Christian athletes do, and there's nothing wrong with that, the ref blew the whistle to start the game, but he was still on his knees praying. Well, the other team, the Corinthian striker, Roberto, his name's Roberto, uh, reviling said this, he seized the spiritual moment and he shot the soccer ball from halfway across the field and made a goal within three seconds of start time. Well, while the goalie was praying, <laughs> the striker was doing action. Well, what are you saying, Rob? When confronted with challenges, listen, folks, we need to know there's a time to pray and then there's a time to act. I'm praying for my marriage. I'm praying for my marriage. I'm praying for my marriage. Well, there probably comes a time while you're praying for a marriage that you're nice to each other. Hello? That you talk right to each other that you're kind and tender-hearted and forgiving and, and you're doing things for each other and you're, and you're just pouring into it. You know what I mean? 
There's, you can pray, pray, pray all you want, but God's gonna go, ma'am, you're married to the guy. guy. Guy, you're married to the girl, right? And you work on, you start doing practical things. Same thing. You, you can't go and say, God, I need a better job. I need a better job. You don't wanna show up on the job you got now. You don't wanna work hard and work diligently and pour yourself into that and do uh, and work your job as the Bible says, as, to, as unto the Lord. Well, Rob, I don't like my job. Well, God didn't say you have to like it, but that's where he has you right now. Work as unto the Lord. I'm in trouble right now, I know. You're going, I don't, you don't know what kind of job I have. But we want God to give us something better, but we don't wanna be faithful in what we already got. Are you hearing me? We wanna pray, 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 pray but we don't want to be practical, practical, practical. Come on, faith without works is dead. So here's the, here's the thing, Ecclesiastes 8, 5, and 6. Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time uh, and a procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by misery. In other words, when we are confronted uh, with challenges, some believers always resort to prayer, which you should always resort to prayer. Not after the fact, before the fact, okay? So prayer has to be a priority, but we don't do it as a reliance on God, but we do it as a way of addicting our, our, our personal responsibility. God, take this off me, you fix it. And God wants to go, no, 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 no. You, you're gonna have to have wisdom. If God does everything, what's the use for us? Am I helping anybody here today? Okay, so what happens is we resort and say, okay, I'm just gonna let God do it, you know, but listen, God's not gonna tie your shoestrings. Bend over and tie them yourself. <laughs> it may take us, some of us, a little longer. It took me, I was a long time tying those shoes this morning, folks. But listen, so let me say this. I believe in prayer. Prayer certainly changes things, but action coupled with prayer is better. Let me show you scripture that proves that. Again, faith without works is dead. Listen, many things in life require effort and responsibility on our part. Then God does his part. Then God acts. Listen, remember the feeding of the 5,000? What if Jesus said, well, we better pray. Guys, disciples, there's a bunch of hungry people out there. Let's just, let's just pray. Jesus, we need to provide food, yeah. And we just prayed. No, no, what happens was he prayed, but he found somebody. Philip found a young person because the adults were too busy and too critical and too judgmental and too tired, huh, right? <laughs> found a young person that says, you know what? Here's five loaves of bread and two fish. You can have mine. And the disciples like made fun of him. What is that? That ain't gonna work. And then, then here's what prayer did. Prayer said, I'll, I'll fix this. So Jesus took it and blessed it. And when he blessed it, he broke it. I'm finding out now some of the broken times in my life, the, 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 the stages in my life where I've been broken, it's actually God setting me up for a blessing. I don't like the brokenness. It hurts. I don't like the struggle, but it hurts. But God uses it to bless and to multiply and bring prosperity and abundance in my life. And look what Jesus did. They fed. I know it said 5,000, but when you add women and children, there were 5,000 men. But when you add women and children, there was 35,000 people that five loaves of bread and two fish fed. On what basis? On prayer and action, okay? He requires our action. What about the wedding at Cana? When they ran out of wine, not grape juice, it was wine, folks, okay? <sighs> Listen to me. They ran out. So Jesus, Mary, his mom's like, you gotta do something about this. This party's just starting. And the Jewish people love to party at weddings. They love to eat, drink, and dance, and celebrate. It's a wonderful experience. And they ran out of the wine. So Jesus said, okay, 
go get, go fill the water pots up with bottles or with water. Could you imagine if, there's, if they said, sat back there and, and they said, Jesus, why can't you just speak it into existence? You mean we got to go out and reload a bunch of these water pots with water? Do you realize they were about that big? Okay. And all of them, that's going to take many guys. So we're going to have to leave the party to go do that. And he says, and the mom says, whatever my boy says to you, you go do it now. So those guys had to go work. They came back and they brought all these water pots filled with water and they're going, what's going on? And Jesus said, okay, just start, start pouring. And they started dipping their glasses and there was no water coming out. There was wine. And then they took a taste of it and they said, this is not no cheap wine. No, no, this is the big buck wine. This is the best wine. Ooh, this is good. And you saved the best for last. It took prayer, but it took action. Folks, we don't have a problem with the praying part, but we do have a problem with the action part. And if we're going to find a way to win, we've got to take action. Can I? somebody say amen? amen? All right? Jesus was encouraging his followers. And a lot of times when we don't get the results that we want right away, here's what we do. Well, it must not be God's will. When something doesn't happen in our time, we automatically think, well, Rust, it must not be God's will. No, do you give up that easy? Do you throw in the towel that easy? One punch and you're down for the count? You want to go and, and call it quits? You, can, you and I cannot take God's silence as something that is not his will. Could it be that he's waiting on you to do something? Could it be that he's waiting on you to take action? Luke 10, or Luke 11, 9 and 10. So I say to you, ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking persistently receives. For he who keeps on seeking persistently Finds, and to him who keeps on knocking persistently, the door will be open. Jesus is talking about the persistent person who comes to a friend's home in the middle of the night while the guy's sleeping, and the guy says, hey, we need some food, I'm hungry, and the guy says, can't you wait till breakfast? Why are you bugging me? And the guy keeps on knocking and the guy says, go away. But the persistent man kept on knocking and kept on seeking and kept on asking until the, the man said, okay, come on in. Listen, God does not want us to take no for an answer so easily. When you're working on something practical, don't say, well, it can't be done. Listen, we are in the 21st century. Anything is possible, my friends, okay? Don't give up. God wants us to make a move, and then he'll make a move. We should not give up just because you're faced with closed doors at times. Anybody have closed doors in your life? Searching for a job, closed door. Searching for something new, closed door. We have those in life, but our answer truly is and could be on the other side. But listen, don't give up so easily. Keep on knocking, keep on seeking, keep on looking to find a way to win. Can somebody say amen? Walt Disney found a way to win. He was turned down so many times. They told him he was the, uh, the most uncreative person they've ever met. Did you know that? He, he was, they told him, no, you're not even creative. And they turned him down for loans for Disneyland. And listen, until he persisted and found a way. Dr. Lester Sumrall, um, a great champion of the faith, uh, whom I've known and talked with, and he'd gone on to be with the Lord, but he said something years ago. He said, champions are a rare breed. They see beyond the dangers, the risks, the obstacles, and the hardship. Can I tell you folks, God did not create us to be the misery of creation. God didn't create you to live a miserable life. God created us to reflect his glory. God created us to reflect his creativity. I think there's a song in that, Michelle. 
take notes. Um, he wants us to use his abil- our abilities and faith to move out of the ordinary and mundane of life and find a way to win in life and find a way to win in our marriages, find a way to win with our families, find a way to make an impact in this world. Never accept things as though they are. No, God has put his power on the inside of you and you have to explore every avenue. Have you explored every avenue? You gotta make that happen. So number two, when we win, God wins. When we win, God wins. First John 5, 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. John Maxwell once said, the significant difference between champions and losers is how they view their circumstances. That word overcome in John is the word nikos, which means to conquer. It means the champion of a games. It's also connected to Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's hyper nikos. That means more than, over and above, greater, top notch, paramount, overwhelming. This is the kind of faith that resides on every person, not just me, not just a few other people. That you can look at and go, oh my God, they got faith. Man, I look at Lori Hawkins, that woman's got faith. But the same faith that's in Lori Hawkins is the same faith that's in Ashton Salmons. It is in me, it's in you, and it is over the top paramount. So we do, we do God an injustice when we say, I, I don't think we, that can be done. I, I just don't, I don't see how that's going to work. When I pastored in Tennessee, I put it in our, we had a staff manual of, you know, do's and don'ts and team culture. And I said, don't ever come to the table and tell us something can't be done because I will fire you. Oh, that's mean. I know it. I only had to fire one person, okay, in my time, all right? But listen, and there was more than just that, just so you know. And because you're probably going, man, he's mean. (laughs) But we're in the people business, Lives are hinging between heaven and hell. People are hurting and broken. Sin messes us up. And so the church is the hope of the world because we're the extension of Christ. And so to say God can't do something or we can't do something, Don't bring that up because that's an injustice to God himself. If we allow defeat to cripple us, then God is not honored and we are not living the best life he has prepared for us. Never, ever settle for a defeated situation in anything, your marriage, your family, your finances, your work, whatever. Quit walking with your head down going, oh, poor old me and I, I just everybody, I'm just telling you, it's, I've, I lose this and I lose that and I'm, come on, I'm here to stir you up. You gotta find a way to win in this life. Somebody say amen. When King Saul, and I'm hurrying, when King Saul was faced with battles, he thought he couldn't win. He settled for inactivity. He said nothing and he did nothing. We've had some leaders like that in our past who settle for inactivity, who don't say nothing and don't do nothing. Listen, all that is necessary to triumph over evil, remember, hear it, is that good men do nothing. Is that good men do nothing. No, we've got to do something. There are two things you should never do when you're in a crisis. One, run away from challenges, and two, let the challenges and the problems paralyze you. Never do that. I read this the other day. Let me read it to you. The stairs of opportunity are sometimes hard to climb, and that can only be well done by climbing one step at a time. But he would go to the top, never sits down and despairs. Instead of staring up the steps, he just steps up the stairs. You got to keep on stepping. Saul has this giant in the Philistines and he's taunting Israel, Jeff, and he is rebuking Israel and he's taunting God. And because of Saul's 
lack of leadership, his lack of inactivity, and he chose to say nothing and do nothing, Saul was paralyzed by this nine foot, nine inch giant who weighed with his armor 900 pounds. And he was down in the valley and he's making fun of God and he's making fun of the children of Israel. It's actually found in 1 Samuel 17. And David is visiting his brothers, taking, him, taking them some homemade pizza and uh, 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 fried potatoes and potato chips and cheesecake because mom cooked all this stuff and said, take it to your brothers. They're on the battle and they're at break right now because nobody wanted to do nothing. David shows up. 17-year-old young man delivering groceries. David said, what's going on here? Oh, he's been taunting us for days, but Saul will not send anybody out. It was the number one army in the world. You realize we had some, Israel had some strong militant warriors on their side and they were fearful. Fear paralyzes us. Some of you don't want to step out in faith sometimes because of fear. Fear what other people will think, fear what what people will say. Fear paralyzes us. And we're not to live by fear because God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He gives us power, love, and a sound mind. So we have to operate in faith. So David said, wait a second, I remember watching my father's flock and a bear came by, was gonna try to steal and eat my, my dad's sheep. Well, what'd you do, David? Well, I wrestled it. And I killed it with my own bare hands. My cousin, was, my, was it Cousin Butch that was drunk? And that they, was it Butchie? It was one of your relatives, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Not dad. And at the Fort Steuben Mall, they had a, 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 a boxing ring set up and you could wrestle a bear. Well, one of my uncles or cousins or something was half tanked. And he showed up and he went to fight the bear. Bear won. Okay. Well, David said, I wrestled a bear and I killed him. And then he said, one other time I was watching the sheep and a lion came out of the woods and was going after the sheep. And I stood in front of the lion and I began to go hand in hand with that lion. And what'd you do? I killed the lion. And he says, what is this uncircumcised Philistine compared to a bear and lion? So David went out and got five smooth stones. Saul tried to put his armor on him and it didn't work. He got five smooth stones, went down there with a slingshot. And and Goliath is saying things. And here's what David said. You come to me with sword, spear, but I come to you. There's something about speaking the name of Jesus. There's something about speaking by where your words are justified, by your words you're condemned. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I don't think it was the rock that killed him first. I think what paralyzed Goliath was that name that's above every name. That that name is more powerful. That name is a st- mighty strong tower. That the, the Bible says that the righteous run into it and are saved. And I'm telling you, when he said the name of the Lord, it paralyzed Goliath. And I'm telling you, that smooth stone, Mike, knocked Goliath upside the head, knocked him down. David ran to him, the 17-year-old picked up this huge sword that was heavy and lifted it up in the air. And when he lifted it up in the air, he went down and he cut the head of Goliath off. And the Bible said he grabbed Goliath's head and lifted it up. And that's that's where you get, this is how you get a head in life. (laughs) And the children and the armies of Israel rejoiced And they went in and defeated the Philistine army that day. David, a 17-year-old young man, found a way to win when there didn't didn't seem to be a way to win. Folks, David triumphed over the Philistines only with a sling and a stone. He had no sword, the Bible says. And he was known throughout Israel. The cool thing about it, he got to pay no taxes for the rest of his life. Who's into that one? Let's get in it, man. I'm going to kill Goliath, sure. And he got the king's daughter, and she was a, 
right? The Bible says she was the fairest of out, of, among the whole nation. And he got some other things, money, uh, a house, because he found a way to win. There's always a benefit to finding a way to win. And my last point is this. God is on our side and will help us find a way to win. So you don't have to win on your own. You don't have to do your family on your own, your marriage on your own, your finances, your career. You, your business, you got God. And he's on your side and he'll help you find a way to win. Psalm 60, verse 12. Come on, Russ. With God, we will gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. Another translation, Lynn, this is pretty good. Listen, another translation says, we can win with God's help. Are you faced with something that seems impossible right now? Are you faced with a battle that's overwhelming in your life? could be your family, could be finances, could be your health. He says, with God, we find a way to win. Listen to me, folks. Some people don't feel like they deserve to win. They feel like God is in heaven saying, nope, you don't deserve to win. Uh Uh-uh. You win, you lose. No, it's not how it is. Romans 8, 31 says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us. Who can be against us? Remember this. There are never any problems that can't be solved. Do you know the best way to get out of a problem is not ignore it? Oh, come on. Some of us like to ignore it. If we feel like we ignore it, it'll go away. Okay? You know, pain in our body should never be ignored. It's there to tell us, yeah, something ain't right. Something's hurting. I'm telling you, when I fell, and I fell hard, and I got back, when they pulled me, he pulled me out, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't walk. I couldn't sneeze. I couldn't cough. I'm like, I got pain. It tells me something ain't right. Something's hurting. Right? It says something needs to be fixed. Don't ignore painful experiences in your life in your marriages, in your families, on your career. Because those painful experiences are to show you what needs to be healed, what needs to be fixed. I'm gonna end with this story. The United States Peace Corps has the ability to deal with any and every tricky condition abroad. Example given to the men and the women who find themselves serving in the jungles of South Africa And this is in the manual. I got this from the internet. It's in the manual of the United States Peace Corps. And in there, it's it's, for the men and women who are in South America, in the jungles, who might be faced with the largest snake in the world called the anaconda, okay? A full-grown anaconda is not just a snake. It's a telephone pole with a temper. Did you ever see one? I mean, they're huge. I mean, it it, it takes 10 men to carry one if it's in a good mood. So here's the instructions from the Peace Corps. If, number one, this is funny, but this is true. If an anaconda attacks you, do not run. The snake is faster than you are, so don't even try to outrun it. Number two, Lie flat on the ground. Put your arms tight against your sides and your legs tight against each other. So you're supposed to lay on the ground like this. Okay? Number two. Okay? Number three, tuck in your chin. This is for real folks. Okay? The snake will come and begin to nudge and climb about your body. Don't panic. That's what it says. (laughs) After the snake has examined you, listen to this, it will begin to swallow you from the feet, always from the feet. Permit the snake to swallow your feet and ankles, period. Do not panic. 
Next. The snake will begin to suck your legs into its body. You must lie perfectly still. This is going to take a long time. This is, what, this is how you, this is what they're saying, okay? When the snake has reached your knees, slowly and with as little movement possible, reach down, take your knife, and very gently slide it into the snake's mouth between the edge of its mouth and your leg. And then it says, suddenly rip upwards, severing the snake, okay? So you're lying perfectly still on the ground. The, the anaconda's got his, he's upright right to here. You take your snake out of the side of your side. Come on, Russ. And it's, he, the manual says you take your snake and you go right up through its mouth and you rip. Okay? This is what it says. Then suddenly rip upward, severing the snake through the top of its head. Then here's the next point. Be sure to have your knife with you. <laughs> Be sure your knife is sharp. Here's the next point. Of course, if you get to number nine or even ten and find out that you've forgotten your knife or that it's blunt, the rest of what we just told you doesn't matter. No situation is ever hopeless. If you can find a way to win while you're being eaten by an anaconda. And the reason why they've given this is because they've seen it happen and they've done it. But can you imagine being the person, lie perfectly still? Yeah, right? Claire Booth said there are no hopeless situations. There are only people who have grown hopeless about them. Please don't ever allow your troubles and challenges to swallow you alive. God will, shall, always provide a strategy and a way to win out of every circumstance or challenge or problem that seems overwhelming. You just got to open up your eyes, open up your ears, have some patience, and have, a, have pray and have some faith to act. So I want to challenge you today. Don't ever go through life not knowing if you can win or not. You can find a way to win. You just got to look for it. And God gives us so many avenues and ways about, from his scripture. Can we, can we pray right now? And I want to pray for you. You may be here today and you're like, Rob, I'm, I'm pretty overwhelmed with my challenges right now. I want to tell you, stick with God. God is with you. And if God is with you, you will find a way to win. Let's pray. Father, I just take this opportunity right now. I pray for every person here who are faced with insurmountable odds, challenges, tough things going on in their life right now and their family and their, maybe their business or their career and their finances and their backs up against the wall. God, you said if we can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And we put our faith and we put our trust in you, almighty God. And we lift up our hearts to you because we know, God, with your help, through your word, through your Holy Spirit, we can find a way to win out of every difficult situations and challenges. Be with every person here today, God. Be with Tracy. God, be with Kathy. Be with the ones who are faced with pain in their bodies and sickness. God, you can make a way where there seems to be no way. God, you can show up even if it's right at the last minute, oh God. You are in the rescuing and the restoring business. So God, we just turn our hearts to you today. And we know with your help, we'll find a way to win and we'll never be the same again. And everybody shout amen. amen. Come on, would you stand to your feet today? How many receive that today? How many will leave here today, take this week and say, I'm going to find a way to win. I'm gonna find a way to win. Listen, God bless you.
Have an, an outstanding, remarkable week. Peace to the people. Peace to the Have a great week. God bless you, folks.